Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are going to talk about some of my bookish pet peeves. So these pet peeves are going to kind of cover multiple different areas. They're going to cover things that I see in books that I don't like, some physical things about books that I don't like, and even things within the bookish community that I don't like to see. Now for the most part a lot of these are very superficial, they're light, they're not all that serious, but I do have a couple things on here that might be on the more controversial side and those pertain to the online bookish community and so I think I'm going to go ahead and start with those, get them out of the way, and then we can end on some lighter notes. Now I shouldn't have to make this disclaimer because we are all adults here but I will go ahead and make it anyway that these are just my opinions. Do not have to agree with me. That is the beauty of being able to have an opinion and I'm more than willing to discuss any of these things further with you down in the comments below assuming they are all respectful in nature. So I'm going to start off with the two things that I would consider on the more maybe controversial side or on the deeper side and the first thing I want to talk about is when people are branding content as problematic. I find it unfair to brand content as problematic and here is why. Just as reading is so subjective everybody could be reading the same book. It could have have totally different experiences and reactions to those books. Problematic is also a very subjective concept. What is problematic to one reader might not be problematic to another reader and when you are deeming content as problematic you are essentially branding it as undesirable. In my opinion when you are deeming content as problematic you are taking it a level above just giving it a negative review but you are actively warning people away from the content which again I find unfair because problematic is very subjective. Now this is not a blanket statement. Not everybody who claims content is problematic is actively warning people away from it. However, what I don't typically hear are reviewers saying this content is problematic and here is why. But you should totally read it and form your own opinion. No, that's not what I hear. I hear this content is problematic and here is why, full stop. There is no additional side to that argument. There's no this content is problematic and here is why, but here are some other reviewers that think differently from me. Go check it out or you should read this book and form your own opinion. It is almost every single time I hear a reviewer call a book problematic. It is basically a warning to stay away from the book, which again, I find unfair since problematic is a very subjective term. And I am also a bit confused as to why there is such a concern over problematic content when life in general is problematic. We probably encounter problematic things on a daily basis and a lot of art is representative of life. A lot of content creators in life are putting their own experiences or the experience of people they know into their art and it is no different with authors and books. They could be putting their own life experiences into the book which is another reason why I think it's a problem to call that problematic. And erasing this content from books entirely is not going to erase it from life. And I'm not entirely sure I understand what good it's supposed to do to completely eliminate problematic content from the books that we are reading or to warn people away from reading those books. Let's take an example that I see the most frequently. This is the example that is probably the most talked about in relation to problematic content. And that is the glorification of toxic relationships or just toxic relationships in general, primarily within the context of young adult books. There are people who are concerned that if toxic relationships are placed within young adult novels that these young adults who are reading these books are going to suddenly get the idea that these relationships are the epitome of ideal healthy real romantic love and that they're going to actively go out and seek these relationships. Now I'm gonna get into this a little bit more in a second but when we make these statements that these things shouldn't be in books because of this that places almost the entirety of the responsibility on the author who is writing the book and almost no responsibility on the reader or if we're talking about young minor readers on the parent or guardian of those readers. The only responsibility an author has is to write the book that they want to write and to write a book that they think people are going to want to read. We as readers have the responsibility to determine if we can handle what we are about to read, if this is content that we want to consume. And I also believe that that includes younger readers. I believe that if content has been published under the YA middle grade age range, both the author and the publisher have determined that this book is suitable for that age range and that age range is capable of handling the material within these books and that they are able to critically think about it. That's the key point here. It is determined that those who are likely going to be reading these stories have critical thinking capabilities and can read these books and understand that it is not reality, that is fiction, what is right, what is wrong. They put a lot of trust and faith in their readers and we as readers need to do the same with ourselves and with the authors as well as the publishers. I do not believe that we as readers have the right to 
defends her authors by saying, you can write this book about this, but you shouldn't include this in that book because of the ideas it may or may not give the reader. Blaming a book for the reason a teenager gets into a toxic relationship is almost kind of like blaming a video game for violence in teenagers. We are placing all of the responsibility on the author and on the video game creators and not on the people who are actually consuming the content or allowing these people to consume that content. I feel like we have to give some trust to ourselves as readers and understand that those who are reading the books are able to handle the content that they are consuming and that they are able to think critically about it. And kind of going back to art imitating life, I'm sure that you yourself have been in or know people who have been in toxic relationships. So when you see this in books, even if it is glorified, it can be extremely relatable because if you have been in a toxic relationship, you know what it means to be in a toxic relationship. You know how you can find yourself within a toxic relationship and you know how romanticized it can seem to be in a toxic relationship. That in some ways is relatable content. So I disagree with people labeling that content as problematic because they don't like the message that they send. I completely understand why you don't like the message that it sends and that is your right. You don't have to like the message that it sends and you don't have to read the book. You don't have to let your teen read the book. But I do feel it's unfair to brand the content as problematic. I feel like when you are doing that you are literally branding that content with a big red slash through it as in do not read, do not approach, get rid of and in my opinion that is a form of censorship. I've also seen people who like to brand content as problematic without giving it historical grace. So they may be reading a book that was written in a time hundreds of years before modern day when things look very very different in terms of societal views and expectations but yet because they are reading those books through a modern lens they are also judging those books through a modern lens. For example many years ago I saw a reviewer who decided that they were not going to read the Outlander series anymore because they did not like the way that women were treated in those stories. Now if you're not familiar Outlander is kind of a science fiction series in which a woman is taken from 1940s I think the London area and transported back in time to 1700s in the Highlands of Scotland. I don't know how they thought women were going to be treated in the 1700s in the Scottish Highlands, but equally is not it. So labeling that content as problematic is a little bit iffy to me because it's historically accurate. So it's totally fine if you don't like the way that women were treated. That doesn't negate the reality of it and, do and it doesn't mean that it's a bad book or a problematic book. It just means it's historically accurate. On a similar note, they will read a book that was written many years ago and it's actually set in the current time. So it was a contemporary during the time it was written. And during this time, Time, certain words or phrases were probably socially acceptable to use. These are words that today we would not even consider using in polite conversation. We think they are rude, they are derogatory. Civilized people do not utter these words in conversation. But back in the day, they were. And again, we're reading these books through a modern lens. We're seeing these words or phrases used and we are demonizing the book. We're using them when back in the day, it was okay to use them. Now that doesn't mean that back in that day, it should have been socially acceptable to use them. However, I think we all know by now how fluid society is. And in another 50 20, 30, 50 years, we are going to find ourselves apologizing for things that we do today that in 30 years are not even close to socially acceptable. Children born right now are going to be absolutely disgusted probably by some of the things that we do and say in modern times. That is the fluidity of society. It's always ever changing. We are always ever learning and growing and progressing, we hope. So if you are reading a book that was written and set in say the 80s or the 90s and you're seeing certain things that we know today are not acceptable, it's not necessarily fair to judge those things based on a modern lens and call it problematic. And I kind of mentioned this word before, but it all kind of leads me into censorship and cancel culture in general. I don't really want to dive too deeply into this because I know that there are many opinions on it, but I truly don't believe that just because a celebrity or an author, etc., does or says something that you or society at large disagrees with, that they automatically should be canceled. We like to say that authors should or should not do something. They should or should not put something within the books that they're writing, but kind of again, to reiterate, I don't feel an author should do anything but write the story that they want to write and that they think people are going to want to read. And again, we as readers have to accept responsibility for what we are reading. Just like writers can choose what they want to write, we as readers can choose what we want to read. And going along with that, we as readers also have the right to express our distaste for the story. We have the right to critically review and evaluate the story and say what we do or do not like about it, but outright canceling the author, censoring the author, labeling it as problematic, pushing people away from from it, I do not personally feel like that is fair and that it should be done. So kind of going back to that toxic relationship example, even if an author was downright praising toxic relationships and glorifying the hell out of them in their books, it's not the author's responsibility to ensure that the reader understands its fiction. It's not the author's responsibility to impart those life lessons on the reader. We are caught in this system.
system where you have to say or do or be a certain way in order to be accepted socially or you risk being canceled. If you don't abide by arbitrary and subjective societal norms that are again very fluid and are going to change in 10, 20, 30 years, you are a terrible, awful, horrible human being and you deserve to be canceled. That is basically how we are currently operating in today's day. There is no accounting for nuance or gray areas or anything like that. It is very black or white. It is a very unrealistic dichotomy and it's absolutely bananas bonkers. So like I said, there's no accounting for nuance. There's no accounting for gray areas. There is no accounting for the knowledge that people are multifaceted and they don't need to be judged or defined by their worst mistake or their worst book. So that was a whole rant that went on a lot longer than I thought I did, but I guess I had a lot more to say on it than I realized. So again, I know that my opinions might be controversial. They might be unpopular, but I just kind of wanted to express them because I don't see these often expressed. I don't see myself often represented in the online bookish community. And I wanted to kind of put this out there for those that may have like the same opinions as me, but don't see themselves represented in this space. Those are it on terms of those bookish community pet peeves. Now let's go ahead and get into some of the lighter stuff. Now y'all know that I cannot make a bookish pet peeves video out discussing book sizes. What is the point of different book sizes? Now I understand why there's a difference between a hardcover and a paperback or even a trade paperback and a mass market paperback. You know, mass market paperbacks are produced in the way that they are so that they can be produced cheaply, more quickly, and so that more people can have easier access to these books. But why are there multiple different size hardcovers? So as an example, these are hardcovers that are on my shelf. So Book of the Month is almost always the tallest hardback on my shelf. Then the one next to it is more of a standard size adult hardcover. Then you have what's probably more considered standard for maybe a YA hardcover, although this one in particular is an adult novel. And then you have this one here on the end, which is actually a UK hardcover. And I don't understand that. Like, why does UK have a different size hardcover than America does? And why do I still get American sized hardcovers from the UK? I am sure that there is some kind of publishing rule book and this is all explained somewhere, but I don't get it. I don't understand why books have to come in different sizes. I never know what size hardcover I'm going to be getting anytime I order a hardcover and that shouldn't be the case. Paperback sizes seem to be a little bit less dramatic, but still I have this super tall, thin paperback and you have this one and then this one is just slightly shorter than this one. Like why couldn't this one be the same size as this one? One of the reasons why this really bothers me is because I like continuity on my shelves and because of all of these different sizes, my shelves are first arranged by genre, but then by size. So like all of the book of the month books are together because they are the same size, followed then by the slightly shorter hardbacks and then the shorter hardbacks, etc. And sometimes if I'm in the middle of a series and I purchase that series, sometimes those books will come to me in different sizes. And so because my shelves are arranged by sizes, that means they can't actually be together on my shelves. That is extremely irritating. And of course, speaking of series, I know that this irritates a lot of people. It doesn't irritate me quite so much as the size thing, but when you're in the middle of the series and the publisher decides to completely change the covers, or maybe the series is completed, but you haven't finished it yet, and they decide to re-release it with new covers. I think the Diviner series is a great example of this because almost every single cover that I have is different. So here is the original cover of the Diviners. This is the very first book. Then we have this. They released it in this kind of style. So this is the second book. And then here is the most recent style. So this is the third book, and I believe the fourth book is also going to have this same style. So every single book that I have in that series is different, but I would much rather than be all the same size because when you're looking at my shelves, you're not necessarily seeing the covers, you're seeing the spines. And it doesn't necessarily bother me if the spines look different from each other as long as they are the same size. And then of course, I've mentioned this already multiple times on my channel, but I'm gonna go ahead and throw it in here because it is legitimately one of my biggest pet peeves. And that is the fact that Goodreads does not allow half star ratings. I feel like this is something that every reader feels. And so I don't really need to say much more about it, but like, come on Goodreads, why? Goodreads knows. Goodreads is very well aware that we want half star ratings, but they're not doing it. They're intentionally ignoring this feedback, which I'm sure is the biggest, most consistent feedback that they have ever gotten and they are ignoring it. It makes me want to switch to Storygraph because I have tried Storygraph in the past and there are a lot of functionality things with Storygraph that I really, really enjoy, but I don't feel like their website is as user friendly as Goodreads. I like the social feed aspect of Goodreads where I go on there and everything is just there on the page and I can kind of scroll through like social media and it's not that way. It's not as easy to use with Storygraph. And also to be fair, I've been using Goodreads for over 10 years at this point. That's where all of my books are logged. That's where all of my reviews are. And I just don't see myself migrating completely to Storygraph or even trying to maintain both of those sites. I just don't think it's going to happen. I overall like a lot of the features of Goodreads more, especially like the group aspect. I'm in a lot of groups on Goodreads as well. And so I prefer Goodreads to Storygraph and I can't see myself ever switching. But just like the one thing Goodreads could do is just give me those stupid half star ratings. All right. So here is something that I see in a lot of books. Now, I know that this is going to be an unusual opinion. I don't necessarily know if it's an unpopular opinion, but it's an unusual opinion because it seems like every single book 
book that I read. Even in books you wouldn't expect this ending to be in. They end with the female protagonist pregnant and rubbing her swollen belly. Like that is the only possible reasonable happy ending that you can expect from a book. It's a woman pregnant with a swollen belly. Now we all know on this channel that I am not a kid person and I don't like reading about kids. So I don't like books that are fully focused on kids or middle grade stories or anything like that. And I am really unusual in the fact that when there is a pregnancy announcement, my immediate reaction is not excitement and joy and bliss. My immediate reaction is why? And it's kind of the same in books. Like I know a lot of people, if there's, especially if there's a big epic romance that you're reading at the end, there's nothing more representative of a happy ending than a woman being pregnant with the love of her life's child. But it's so overdone. I was actually reading a thriller novel, a thriller novel, y'all. No real romance in there whatsoever. And it ended that way. Why? Why does it always end that way? I don't think I would be nearly as peeved about this if it wasn't so common. Why does it have to end with a pregnancy? Because that is not representative of every woman's happy ending. You know what I mean? And I feel like there could be more diversity in that regard. That's probably a weirder pet peeve, but it is definitely a pet peeve. But that's just one I wanted to mention. Another thing that I hate to see in books, something that is really overdone, is when you have a mean girl or kind of crazy stepmother trope where the females in the story are villains in some way. I always want to see stories that have a little bit more of a support between the women groups in there. So I love reading stories when the female friendships actually bolster and support the story and the main character, not hinder it or hurt it or are toxic in any way. And why is the stepmother or the mother-in-law, I think I was saying stepmother when I met mother-in-law, but why is the mother-in-law always crazy? I think I might be triggered by that just a little bit because I dated in the past a mama's boy. Oh my gosh, did it drive me nuts. Oh, he couldn't do anything without asking his mom. And I just couldn't, I did not have the patience for that. So I just hate reading about that. And so it's just like, it's so overdone. It's just one of those things that I see all the time and it's almost to the point where I'm bracing myself for it. I'm like, ooh, there are these girls. They're probably gonna be bitches. They're probably gonna be mean. They're probably gonna be awful, you know? And I just, I'm tired of seeing it and I want something different. Not every group of friends has to be mean girls. You know what I mean? And of course, miscommunication is also a big one for me. I hate when the story hinges on miscommunication because it is beyond frustrating. If a story would literally not exist, if the characters just talk to each other, I don't think that's a good story. I think that's very lazy storytelling. Now, if there's an instance of miscommunication in a story that's not the full plot of the story, it doesn't bother me as much. It doesn't need to happen at all, but it doesn't bother me as much. But when I'm reading a story, particularly a romance, and the one thing that is keeping the main characters apart could be solved with just somebody talking, why aren't they talking? So that really, really frustrates me. And kind of along these same lines, unnecessary conflict, particularly within realms of romances that happen too quickly. So I like to use Archer's voice as an example of this because I write Archer's voice by Mia Sheridan and I was loving it. I was in it. I was invested. I was loving their relationship. But what happened, it's on the longer side too. I would say it's probably like four or 500 pages. But what happens is this romance builds very quickly within the first half of the story. And so in order to fill the second half of the story, the author has to create unnecessary conflicts in order for the drama to keep going, in order for the plot to continue, in order for her to fill these four or 500 pages. And I hate that. Why can't we have a more slow burn angsty romance and then maybe a little conflict here and there that they have to overcome to cement their love, to strengthen their love. You know what I mean? But why is it that we have a 500 page romance and the romance goes super quick that by the halfway point, you know that they love each other and they want to be together. And then you fill the other half of the book with this unnecessary conflict that really, really, really doesn't need to be there. In Archer's voice, this happens like three or four times. Three or four unnecessary things come to pull these two characters apart. And it didn't need to be that way. I understand the need for drama. I understand the need for that angst, but when it's so ridiculous, it's implausible, it's unnecessary. I don't want to see it in my book. If I'm reading romance, it has to meet very specific criteria. And that's why I'm really hesitant about romance these days, because this is what I see a lot of the time. So that one really, really irritates me. Can we also talk about painless virgin sex in books? Now, I know a lot of people have the opposite qualm with books, how like they'll read books where the sex for a virgin is so painful and it's bloody and they don't understand why it is that way. But those are never the books that I read. All of the books that I read have virgins having sex for the first time. And it's, you know, it's just okay. You know, it's, it's mildly painful, but it's fine. And then immediately after that, they could go again. Like they can go again all night long, orgasm after orgasm after orgasm. I'm sorry. Was my first time completely abnormal to everybody else's first time? Was everybody else's first time just this one long all-nighter sex marathon? Like to me, that is unrealistic. You have your virgin sex and it's just so magical and there's barely any pain at all. And it just feels so good and amazing that you want to keep going all night long. To me, that is unrealistic. So I'm going to move on from that point because it's a little bit gross, but that's a big one for me too. I also am not a fan of too many characters in a book kind of thrown at you all at once. This is particularly true in a lot of thrillers, especially when it's going to be like a locked room mystery where you have a bunch of people in one place and a crime happens and you have to try to figure out who done it. The author will just throw all of these characters 
fingers at you and you're trying to remember not only who their names are but what their backgrounds are and who are they related to within the context of this atmosphere like is it somebody's husband brother cousin like what their relationship is to the other people in the room so you're trying to keep all of these straight as a character driven reader I find that really frustrating because there's never going to be any way for me to fully connect to any or all of these characters I'm barely going to even be able to keep any of these characters straight and so I know right off the bat when I am in a story like where they're just tossing character after character after character I know that I'm not going to be getting a character driven story I'm going to be getting very brief glimpses into each one of these characters I'm probably going to be getting multiple viewpoints but I'm never going to get a deep connection with any of them and so that's a big pet peeve to me because I know I'm not going to get the kind of story that's going to actually last with me it's going to be something superficial that's just going to go in one ear and out the other too many characters is not just a pet peeve but it's like a warning sign for me to know that I'm not going to get the book that I'm going to love unconditionally for the rest of my life now some authors have the ability to do this really really well where they throw a lot of characters at you but you are still able to differentiate them you're still able to keep them straight you're able to know their names who they're related to what their background is and all of that stuff and I really applaud the authors that can do that but even still in those stories I'm not emotionally connecting to those characters so they're being thrown too many characters is one and then lastly another thing that I see not even within the online bookish community this is primarily with people outside of the bookish community judging what and how people read right you hear it all the time listening to audiobooks isn't reading you're not physically reading a book so you're not reading even though I am listening to an audiobook and I'm consuming the same exact material as a person who is physically reading that book I am not considered a reader because most of what I consume is via audiobook so I hate when people are judging what and how people read and when you're telling people who are listening on audio that they are not readers you are also completely discounting the people who literally cannot physically read because perhaps they have eyesight issues or things of that nature and so that's very ableist is I think the term that you would use for that or when you're just judging what people are reading in general you know romance in particular you see somebody out there reading a romance novel with one of those big hulking guys with their shirts off and you judge what they're reading because that's not literature well let me tell you pal I'm not going to go out there and read Charles Dickens because I don't want to read Charles Dickens classics are not fun for me things that are deemed good literature some of the 50 best books of all time I don't want to read it I have no interest in reading it and I don't care what anybody is reading as long as they are reading if they have found some type of book no matter what it is that fuels their love and passion for reading go for it what is the harm in this to me that is the magic of books is there's such a wide range so many people everybody can find what they love in books if they just try hard enough to find it and you shouldn't put out that flame you shouldn't dampen that by judging what somebody else is reading reading as reading as reading it doesn't matter what they are reading it doesn't matter whether you value what they are reading it doesn't matter whether you consider that literature or not and I cannot stand it when somebody is judging how or what another person reads I would much rather have you read and love my most hated books than to not read at all I would much rather know that you are out there finding things that you love now don't get me wrong I will have a discourse with you about why you're wrong about how good the book is but that is just the perks of being a reader and knowing so many people with so many varied tastes in books and there's such a wide array out there and that is what I love so much about this community I am able to find so many different kinds of books I'm able to bring so many different kinds of books to y'all and that's just the beauty of this space so I don't like to see people trashing it or judging it in any way shape or form read what you want read what your heart wants all right y'all that is it those are some of my bookish pet peeves I hope y'all enjoyed please comment down below and let me know if you agree or disagree with anything that I said in this video I'm totally willing and open to talking with you more about these in the comments as long as it is respectful and of course I would love to know some of your bookish pet peeves this list was just quickly put together it's not comprehensive at all I'm sure that when I'm done filming this video I will think of a million other pet peeves that I have in books but these are just some of the ones that I came up with off the top of my head so I would love to know what some of yours are and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up I post two videos a week sometimes three if I have my shit together and there's a third video to film and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.